Uh, number one on the, oh, sorry, Joy, you got me. All right, again, this is March 25th, 2022, 9 a.m. This is the notice meeting for the Child Support Guidelines Committee. We're gonna start with agenda item number one, which is calling the meeting to order and doing the roll call. Uh, Kathleen Baker. Present. Margaret Chapel. Karen Cliff. Present. Uh, Assemblywoman Cohen. Uh, Ellen Cresilius. Here. Jack Fleeman. <laughs> Melissa Hardy. Dallas Harris, or Senator Harris, sorry. Judge Hoskin. I'm here. Senator Pickard. I am here. Judge Robb. Present. Joseph Sanford. Present. Judge Shirley. And Justice Stiglitch. Here. All right. Let the record uh, reflect that we have nine present. We need eight for a quorum. We have our quorum. We are going to move on to agenda item number two, which is public comment. For those of you in the public that would like to give public comment, we restrict it to two minutes per person. Um, I will unfortunately be rude and cut you off, but we, we do stick to that rule. There will be a second opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting if uh, you need to say more. Uh, Ms. Tomlinson, if we could please take public comment at this time. To give public comment, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting or press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. I'm showing no hands are raised at this time. All right, thank you. We will move on to agenda item number three, which is approval of meeting minutes from February 18th, 2022. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Thank you, Senator Pickard. Would somebody second, please? I'll second, Justice Stiglitch. All right, thank you, Justice Stiglitch. Any further discussion about the meeting minutes from February 18th? Hearing none, all in favor, state aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. All right, we will move on to agenda item number four, which is discussion and recommendations on the master document for approved language changes, exhibit one for this meeting. Do we have any discussion on this item? I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> there will be some cleaning up, uh, obviously. We got all kinds of, it's a rainbow now. It's starting to be very colorful. So, all right, thank you. We will move on to agenda item number five. Discussion and recommendations on proposed reorganization and language changes to the NAC. Uh, see exhibit two from committee members, Joseph Sanford and Mr. Fleeman. Mr. Sanford, uh, would you like to present this item? Maybe, if we can unmute. <laughs> You're still muted, Mr. Sanford, so. Is that? There we go, now we can hear you. Yes, would you like to uh, talk to the committee about your changes from exhibit two? Sure, I'm trying to find exhibit two is where I'm most. Oh. I can email it to you real quick if we need to. It would have come in an email from Joy, uh, well, you, Gave it to Joy to start with, but okay. Tomlinson. But I will forward the exhibits to you right now. And Madam Chair, I've been able to locate all the exhibits. I can't find the agenda. Um, oh, here it is. It was in the same email, but I will forward it to you also, Judge Rob. Thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I found it. Um, the Essentially, the, the main idea, 
as as has been reflected by a number of, of our comments, especially from uh, the matrimonial lawyers, there is uh, currently some issues with how the ordering in the statute is. And one of the easiest ways to see that is some confusion about what exactly the child support order would include as part of child support and what is sort of not. Um, the, uh, the intention here was to create a, um, was to create a new statutory piece that has, uh, and, <laughs> yes. um, is to have a new uh, a new section in the code that establishes a total child support or total uh, support child support obligation, defining that as the sum of the, the individual pieces that we had previously indicated as a you know do this first, do this second, do this third uh, language, and that. Some of that language didn't end up, and I agree it was very difficult to create. And so I guess I will start with uh, the, the potentially new language, 425.xxx is what I've called it. It's on page 10. And I know, I mean, this is, this is just, just the start, um, but essentially it is to create a child support obligation. Uh, the total child support obligation is the sum of and you'd have the base child support obligation that we use through our, uh, we call it right now the schedule, or uh, there, there's been some, some different pieces, but essentially it's the calculation that uses our percentages and, the, and is the standard formula, uh, 425, 140, or from, So maybe there must be a typo there. Maybe it's supposed to be NAC 425-140 um, as appropriate. So either it uses the low income base table or the formula as the base support obligation. And then you would have any adjustments that are in NAC 425-150 are going to be um, added into the sum either as a, a negative number if it's a deviation downward or it will be added to the sum if it's a deviation upward. And then there's an equitable division of child, another type of child care costs. Uh, care costs. <laughs> uh, care costs determined pursuant to NEC 425-130. If the that shoe was, fits, wear it. <laughs> um, and that was previously language that we had finagled up into 140. And so I think that just some determination ought to be had as to whether we want to make 140 have, I think it was addressing the same problem. And so whether it's done this way or the other way, um, the either the childcare costs in 130 or what we end up making with the new 140 and then the equitable division of uh, medical support is determined to 425, 135. And I know some of the folks that I had talked to in my office had some concerns about including the medical support as part of the child support definition because they like it to be kept separate um, for, for enforcement purposes. Uh, I don't know that that matters as much to the private bar, uh, but it does, it does have some, uh, some concerns with my, my folks, but that was, that was along the idea. Um, and that would address a lot of the issues about whether we wanted to have something called the schedule and how things were going to be added together. Um, and then throughout the document, the idea was any, any part of the code that had previously said, um, you know, pursuant to guidelines or um, as a reference to child support as a sort of a vague piece of what, what parts that would include. It now includes a reference to this new, the new provision 425.xxx. So that you would say um, the child support obligation would be the total child support obligation instead of just 
child support obligation. Um, and the guidelines, same, same sort of changes. Um, and that way we don't have the guidelines being discussed as just the formula when it's meant to be the entire piece of the NAC. I like this, this Kim Surratt. Um, I think this will help us sustain an audit from the federal, from our federal audit also, because it, it, it accumulates that more into one solid formula for us, um, probably way far better than we did before or what our end product from before. Um, I like it. I mean, we need probably do some tweaks and twists of a few words here and there, um, but the general concept I like a lot. And I much prefer referencing the, the NACs through this, a specific NAC um, versus uh, the, the varied language that we had before. Do we have other committee comments on this? I, I have a couple of questions if I may. Yes, Senator. Thank you. Uh, uh, I agree. First, uh, uh, I really like the idea of, of starting out before we actually get into the meat of the calculations. I'm kind of surprised we didn't do this before. Uh, uh, so what you've added on, uh, four, or on page 10, 425 XXX, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a, a, a good, solid introductory piece that should come ahead of uh, all the calculations. I do have a couple of questions on some of the other changes. Um, um, back up to, um, uh, uh, this is, uh, I can't tell, it's page three, uh, 425.110. Um, um, I'm uh, not sure if this came from the, uh, um, um, I almost said AARP, that dates me. Um, the AML uh, uh, language or, or uh, what, but uh, there are two things. Number one, in sub one, uh, where we've stricken the language that does not comply with such guidelines, uh, uh, I'm not hung up on guidelines, but I, I, my understanding is that this paragraph is strictly for uh, uh, stipulations that do not uh, comply with the guidelines. And because the section headings typically are not interpreted as part of the statutory language. It references there that do not comply with the guidelines, but I think we probably still need that in the language, uh, uh, in the body of the uh, language below. So uh, otherwise, um, I, I, I think we kind of lose focus on what this paragraph is, is talking about. And that may just be me, I, I don't know. Uh, but I would think that on line three, that we would want to retain the language that does not comply with the guidelines or schedule or whatever we end up calling this, uh, uh, although I personally prefer guidelines. And then when it comes down to sub uh, 1D, where we uh, have, uh, and I like the idea of changing public assistance to TANF. Senator, but, we yeah. already voted on D's language. That was, uh, Mr. Sanford started with that master okay. document with the changes. That right. was our prior vote on that, so. All right, no problem. But I would think we would uh, wanna look at that. Um, is the blue also then? That's what the blue is in D, yes. Okay. So that's from the master document. And those were the changes we made. Okay, um, that's yeah. fine. I just was, I'm concerned that uh, if Congress changes the name, we better have uh, in there some language that says, or its successor. Otherwise it becomes invalid uh, when Congress changes the name. Um, uh, in fact, we probably should uh, uh, change that to refer to the statute uh, by citation instead of the name or put both in there. But anyway, just a thought. Okay, other committee members comments? Uh, Kathleen Baker, for the record, I, I would just point out that for the medical support in 425.135, it really doesn't address uh, who's paying the cost of it. Um, and so it talks about it needs to be provided and it talks about what the cost can be, but it doesn't talk about the court having the ability to equitably divide that premium cost. And I'm, I'm thinking that was just sort of left out last time we did this and maybe we should address it because otherwise, when you look at the new section, 
talks about medical support, but it doesn't talk about medical support cost of the premium. So just. Uh, I was going to say, uh, Madam Chair, this is just for the record. I, I had made some comments in the Word version of this, and that was one of the comments that I had noted was that um, there actually isn't in our current 135 an equitable division language uh, or about how it actually the payment would be done. And so that was something that probably should be included in here, but it wasn't necessarily within the scope of, of what I was doing. But um, it was very good about defining what reasonable medical care costs were and things like that. But, you know, at, you know um, I didn't actually see, and the court shall equitably divide the costs of medical support. Okay, additional committee comments. Yeah, I, uh, I I forget the name of the case. Maybe uh, Judge Rob or Judge Hoskin can remind us. But there's a case uh, from the Supremes that suggested that um, uh, you know these deviations. This is back when we had deviations. The deviations were supposed to be uh, the exception rather than the rule. And uh, I remember um, uh, in many of the conversations. Uh, previously that, uh, um, and I don't remember if it was in the child review committee, child support review committee or, or separately, but I remember in the past discussions about how uh, uh, those premium costs generally are not included as part of child support. Um, and I know we've kind of uh, uh, batted at this a few times, but I don't recall a decision on our part as to whether or not we've decided to make medical support, including the premiums, uh, uh, something that we divide similar to uh, what we do with childcare. That would be my personal preference, but I know that there's a fair amount of resistance to that. Kathleen Baker, for the record. I seem to remember in our original committee meetings that that is one of the issues we talked about and it was actually my understanding, I was surprised when the NAC came out, that it didn't address the sharing of the insurance premium on an equitable basis. So I think we, I think we went back in the minutes, we would find that we did have the discussion, and I would certainly support having an equitable division um, uh, part of the language for the sharing of the health insurance premium costs. So for the purposes of the public agenda per point right now, I'll need to do an agenda item about how it's divided, whether the word equitable is used or not, and how that medical part element of how it's calculated as a separate agenda item. For today, the agenda item right now is just whether it goes into that total child support. So if we could address it that way, that would be helpful for the agenda purposes. Kathleen Baker, for the record, I would actually support having that being part of the uh, child support cost. And with respect to Mr. Sanford's language, um, on number four, an equitable division of the cost of um, the medical support and medical insurance premium. Which is true. So for our agenda purposes, that is in the exhibit, the word equitable. So I, I suppose it's on the table to discuss. Trying to keep us legit right now. <laughs> Make sure we're, we're focused here. Um, Additional thoughts or comments? I, I would say, I, just from my perspective, I do believe we said that the medical insurance had to be calculated into the child support calculation. Uh, whether it was equitable or not, it just it had to be part of the equation. But um, I do know we had some other committee testimony specifically from the DWSS perspective and some of the federal issues there with medical insurance. Yeah. Ms. Cliff? Kim, this is this is Karen um, from Clark. That's my recollection recollection exactly. Um, it should be considered, but there were some concerns about a higher child support amount and balancing ability to pay, and and a lot of the concerns that 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 come with the equitable um, division of the child support and giving the court the latitude to 
reduce the health insurance because we because of contempt and a lot of other things that the program looks at and driver's license suspension and and administrative um you know passport suspensions and so a lot of those tools we were very concerned about dividing the health care costs and, and what that would look like with the respondents ability to pay so i think we left it as it has to be considered but there doesn't necessarily need to be an exact equitable division of the cost. And, and I think that's where the state was comfortable. And as a program, we were more comfortable. Okay. Well, and I'll just pitch in there. When we use the term equitable, we do that because uh, uh, we make the distinction throughout the statutes where uh, equitable does not necessarily mean equal. And so the court can, can consider the equitable side of this and if it's zero on one side and it's still equitable uh, they can do that the court then has discretion and and i'm pretty confident that judge rob and judge hoskin don't want to give up any of their discretion um and nor do i want to take any from them so i uh, i think that what we do need to do is uh, maybe define medical support more clearly um, by adding the language uh, support, maybe including uh, insurance premiums, or, or maybe I'm just mistaken, maybe medical support is synonymous uh, with uh, uh, the insurance premium, but I suspect that that's not quite exactly the same. They're not perfectly coextensive. So I appreciate, this is Karen again from Clark. I appreciate the discussion. My, my, my preference is that, um, well, I think we have someone here from the state today, correct? Is that, is that right? Yes, Ms. Chappell's on. Okay. <laughs> this was such a big discussion the last go around. I it was. It very well that I, I just, I understand the need to discuss it. I just wanna make sure that we have the appropriate representation here today to make sure we have a thorough discussion on it. Um, and I don't know if, if Margo, are you prepared to discuss this today or would, would you feel more comfortable kind of getting the, the back history on some of the prior testimony on this issue. The latter, please. Thank you. And yeah. uh, Kathy is available today, but I'm just not familiar enough with that history. Um, so if, if, the, if the committee would like the state to respond um, adequately, then we, we probably need to uh, postpone it till the next meeting or invite Kathy on. I, I would agree with that because I do know, I agree with Ms. Clip. There was extensive testimony and extensive input specifically from the state about what they could and couldn't do um, based on some other restrictions they had on the back end uh, that we're not seeing and knowing about. Um, so I would rather that research be done. So taking, excluding the word equitable for right now, let's talk about Mr. Sanford's changes without getting wrapped up in the equitable part of it. <laughs> so this is Karen again from Clark, just a typographical concern. Uh, the very, first of all, I wanna say that um, Joe and Jack did an amazing job. Um, so thank you very much. Um, the last page um, where we have NEC 425 and we're talking about the total child support obligation. Are you, are you following me, Joe? Last page, it's all in red, one, two, three, yeah. four. Right, yeah. so check, right. So number three, it says child scare costs. Yeah. Just, you can remove the S. Yes, I, I've seen, I see, I see that uh, as a, there's a typographical error and then there's also the, the typographical error, error in number one that okay, perfect. needs to be addressed. Otherwise, I think it looks great, thank you. And I did confirm um, with Kathy that we need to we need to um, postpone any input from the state, do the, ra the the background research, and, and get back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just Madam Chair, Judge Hoskin, before we leave it, I, I don't think three is necessary. I think we eliminated one thirty, and I don't think you need to have that included twice. It was incorporated into one forty, so it's handled by number one. Once we eliminate the double reference to one forty, I think we're okay. Okay. And I believe part of that was, at least when I was first starting to work on this, we, the master document hadn't gotten to that point. And so yeah. I think it was sort of, a, I think I'm one iteration behind. And so I'm thankful that Kim is here to help uh, do all of that. Um, 
And so I think either that I think that that is if it's going to be included in 140 that it addresses the same issue in number one. I think this is a great cleanup personally. I, I the approach of instead of trying to change the language, which was some of the testimony we received and trying to come up with all new terms that we had to define, just referencing the statute numbers, I think is exactly the answer we needed. All right. And, so, uh, uh, Madam Chair, well, before I forget yet again, uh, when we uh, put the uh, language in the master document in 120 or 425.140, we retained a reference to 425.130 that needs to get fixed. And uh, I forgot to mention that last time. Okay, I'm, uh, help me follow that again. Say it's that on again. page six of the master document. And I'm sorry, this is off the, the specific agenda item, but I'm gonna forget yet again if, if I don't mention it. Um, uh, that 140 makes reference to 425 130, but right above that, we have deleted 130, so we need to fix that reference in the master document. Okay, so Thank I think, you. yeah, so maybe the motion that needs to be made is that any reference to section 130 needs to be removed or realigned. Okay. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, state aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, let me make a note. I've got lots of notes going. Master. Okay. Uh, Mr. I, I'm just gonna put on the record. I, I think if we go with the new language, at least my preference is to actually keep 130 and move and just take the exact language that we currently have, put at the bottom of 140 back into 130 because my recollection of the reason we moved it was because it was so confusing about whether what to include or not include in child support. And I, th I think including it 140 was kind of a fix towards that. But it, to me, at least it makes 140 seem a little bit confusing now because it just has the court must then consider when we're going to be doing the same thing as part of the new dot XXX. Um, and so instead of having, you know, the formula and child support in one piece, we would have child support being its own piece, but be referenced in the new new.xxx in a, I think, a more clean and appropriate way. At least, at least my understanding of the reason we moved it to 140 was because it was so confusing about whether it was part of child support and it wasn't being, I guess, reviewed the way that it should have been. Um, I don't, I don't have my heart set and I just think that it's more the language is going to be the same. I don't think it changes right. anything other than it's just clearer um, to me. I agree, especially if your new provision is placed before each of these sections, which is going to renumber everything anyways. But um, additional committee comments? Sure, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Keith Picker for the record. I think part of, at, at least my recollection is, is we were going through initially um, the practical application of this. Uh, there were two components to the, um, uh, the uh, um, child care costs. And uh, um, one of them was, you know, it didn't look like it was part of the calculation. The other was that it didn't look like it was part of the calculation because it occurred before the calculation. So maybe what we do, because I, I, I'm i sensitive to what uh, Joe is saying. I, 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 it, it, I think he's right. And um, not that that's a surprise, Joe. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, it, it, it is 
a separate consideration, but it does need to be included. And I, I understand, or I seem to recall that the state wanted to include that as part of the of, you know, formal calculation piece as well. But at the end of the day, if we move 130 down below 140 in the renumbering of this, and we say at the outset under the uh, XXX on page 10 of exhibit two, that uh, child care costs are included. And then we do 140. This is the calculation based on or the component based on income. And then 130, whatever the new number is, uh, would immediately follow uh, would then, okay, and here's the child care cost. And then separately, a provision about the uh, uh, medical support then we would have them segmented appropriately so we can consider factors or whatever else is we're trying to go through each of those calculations. And then at the bottom, wrap up with the total calculation includes all these things. And then I think it guides particularly, uh, I was having a conversation with another uh, district court judge about how child support uh, is, you know, 70% or so of litigants are pro se, and they are having a very difficult time following the guidelines. So if, if we kind of do a better job of segmenting these out, and then, you know, at the beginning and at the end, bringing it all together, I think we might be a little clearer in how this goes. So anyway, that's a long winded way of saying I think uh, Joe's on the right track. I agree. I'll say it will cause, and I've always had this concern with some other um, edits that have been requested at the legislature, that it will cause a renumbering of all the NACs, but at least they're, they've not been around in their, their current numbering for 20 years. We're at least fresh right now enough to not cause every single pleading, every single template, and every single office to be changed. Um, to Right now, it's okay, I think, but um, I think it's, I absolutely agree with this. I think we do Mr. Sanford's new language as a statute first, then the current 140 language as the, the next statute, the new 130 language, the more defined uh, childcare language that was in our master document as 140 as the third element, right? And then the medical insurance uh, NAC which I can't think of the number right now. <clears throat> Kathleen Baker, for the record, would we want to put the low income schedule 145 ahead of the child care? So 140, 145, what is now 130, and then what is 135? Between the current 140 and before we talk about, well, uh, there was a recommendation by AAML on how to approach that where you you say it's either all of these provisions or the low income schedule or this calc it's, it's 140 or it's the low income schedule, right? That's what you're starting with. Um, so it, yeah, it goes somewhere in there. <laughs> uh, don't we, Joe, yeah, just yeah, sorry, go ahead, Joe. Just on the record, the, the way it's, I currently have it in the language I'd put was uh, there's a base child support obligation you know, in, as opposed to just the, the total. So you have a base and a total and the base is either the formula or the low income table. And so you, you pick one um, in yeah. terms of calculating the total. And so know that there's, that's the typographical error that's in number one right now where it's, um, uh, the base child support obligation is determined by either NAC 425-140, whatever that new number is going to be, or NAC 425, and it should be dot 145 as applicable. Um, okay. And so yeah. that'll have, I, I think that was similar to what the AMLA had um, suggested. I don't think it's exactly the same because obviously we did a, a different fix than they had proposed, but it is the same idea. Yeah, and that was what I was essentially going to say uh, 
he probably said it better than I did. I, I thought that the table was and uh, in the alternative when someone's income base income was uh, too low uh, or within the, the uh, ambit of the uh, uh, table that uh, then we consider uh, the child support and medical support uh, as uh, additional items to consider as even in, even though it's the low income table. So uh, I, I, I like Kathleen's idea where we put that in. I think we should probably, as Joe was alluding, uh, make it a little clearer that uh, from the outset under 140 that it's either this or the uh, low income table. And uh, I think we can do that with another subsection. So we in, in 140, we could say, um, uh, and this is just I'm thinking out loud, we could talk about the uh, um, uh, you know, one through five, uh, and then sub six would be in the alternative, the low income table, or use an entirely different subsection of NAC 425 to deal with that. And then we deal with uh, the next subsection talking about child care costs and the next subsection talking about um, uh, medical support. What, I'm going to throw out another wrench. Um, <laughs> would it make it clearer if in the new XXX, it's the only language <laughs> that we have right now, um, there was A was you do these four steps and then B is after you've calculated B, only then do you do the adjustments. Um, only to make the adjustments, because right now, I don't know that the adjustments really are part of the formula. That was the point was that takes you out of the formula, right? I'm concerned about the adjustments being, well, I, I guess from a federal perspective, it's better for us that they're part of the formula, but. Um, but are we looking, sorry to interrupt, but are, are we looking at the medical and childcare costs as adjustments? Because no. I thought. Okay. That's why I'm saying A is the base medical child care or child care medical. B is after you determine that, that's your child support amount. Now you now you go into adjustments. Yes. And I think that's how we've currently got it structured. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm I I I was on a different topic. So uh, um, let me make sure I'm clear. What I'm thinking is, uh, and looking at XXX, it's the base child support as determined by 140, or, and this may be language we need to add to this, uh, uh, or as determined by the low income table, and then two adjustments uh, uh, for the uh, uh, child care costs, and then three uh, for the medical costs, and then uh, uh, let that stand alone as the calculation. Is a is the calculation, and then step two is the court will consider yeah. the adjustments. Yes. Or is that well, just clear in the statutes already? I don't know that it is. If you're just saying, uh, Keith Pickard again for the record, if you're just saying to add to this XXX as the, the roadmap, uh, uh, section um, A being the basic calculation and B being the adjustments. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a, that would make a it. A is the total child support obligation. B just says then the court, after determining the total child support obligation, the court consider any possible adjustments or whatever language. Yeah, I like that. Additional committee comment on that? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Joe Last time I had just remarked the only concern I had with doing uh, an ordering was was potentially building in objections and errors where if it wasn't done in the exact order that was requested, you know, currently the sum idea is that right. as long as it's considered and it's included within the order, then you then you've you've met it. If we start to do things like you will do this and then you will do this. I, I just have concerns. I know how my hearings go. Um, you know, someone will bring up something that's an adjustment, and all of a sudden now we're, well, did you do did you do things in the correct order? Um, I do. Obviously, the adjustments have to be considered. Um, I think that 
Yeah. But it doesn't have to, though. That's where I disagree, because the way the adjustments are is the court may consider those if they exist, if they're necessary. But the, the, the must are is the, the base child support plus child care plus medical. That's the must. But I don't know that the adjustments in 150 are a must. They may be used. They may not be used. I guess my only concern is at least one of our adjustments is ability to pay. And so I'm hoping well, that, that is included in all of them. But, <laughs> um, and, and maybe those are just more common in my cases. And so um, right. I guess I had considered it as if, it, if as long as it's being considered, then if we have it within the formula, if, I think the way it is, it's any, any adjustments that are applicable, they may not be. Um, I just didn't want to get in a situation where we say, okay, we're going to calculate A, B, and C without, you know, sort of a, with blinders on towards these adjustments. And then we get to the adjustment stage and say, oh man, we've got a child support order that there's just no way they can do because, because it's already got equitable in the child care and the health care. I'm hoping that equitable is also including you know, review of ability to pay and special needs of the child and things like that. And so um, that, that's just my, my comment. I don't think it's the, the, the wrong idea because the, the adjustment factors is going to be the, the biggest ability of the court to hopefully shift things to Discretion. something mm -hmm. discretionary. But um, I just, I the only issue I had with the with the order is that I know at least where I'm at with practicing attorneys that I have, I, I could see objections of, well, if, if they had followed the order correctly, we may have gotten a different answer. I don't know that they'd win on that, but just that that would be a lot of my day. I guess this is back, this is back to some of the core stuff we went through in the first committee meetings, but um, cause when I think about, and I think this is part of the confusion of where we're seeing different applicabilities, which is if we're going to adjust, I think what we're adjusting up and down is the totality of the, the base calculation plus medical plus child care. And then it's a determination. Was that number a number that needed to be adjusted or not? Um, versus you take the base, adjust it up and down, and then add in child care and medical. Maybe it's it's saying the same thing. I don't know that I'm saying anything all that dramatically different, but this seems to be the confusion about what gets adjusted and what doesn't. Is it just the base that's getting adjusted up and down, and then you're determining uh, the child care and the medical to add on after that? I don't think, I don't, this, well, I, maybe because under child care and medical, we're including the word equitable so that the court's still adjusting based on equities, right? And abilities. I am in the semantic. I This is way deep into very abstract way of looking at this, but this is the kind of complaints we're getting from public comment as to what the issue is, is how to make that part clear. What are you adjusting? What are you not adjusting? Kathleen Baker for the record. Um, I would say that I think I think Joe has a very good point in terms of the word equitable. If we are looking at the base uh, calculation based on percentages or low income schedule, and then we go on an assumption that each party is equally responsible, one half of child care, one half of medical insurance premium costs, then you have that total. And after that, you really would do the ability to pay because from a practical standpoint, when I'm in my hearings and we're looking at child care costs and we're looking at insurance premium costs, the court is always looking at ability to pay. So it almost seems to me that we really look at half and half and then we go to the adjustments where the ability to pay would come in. That's just a thought. Committee comment? <laughs> we're all in our heads now. Um... Hold on, I'm looking at 150 language again. I, I, I'm wondering if the judges can uh, kind of chime in to just, I, I'm curious to know, do you guys see this 
Do you see this as a potential problem um, if we uh, start getting into the ordering? I know when Joe was first mentioning that, Judge Rob, you were kind of nodding your head. So uh, I don't know if you were nodding about something else, but um, I, I'm just wondering, is this it is the ordering opening up an avenue for a uh, uh, assertion of error that would tie up a case uh, a little longer than need uh, need occur? I love it when Keith throws us all under the bus. I appreciate that. Um, As do I. I'll yeah. I'll tell I'll 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 tell you my thoughts through this process, and I'm I'm having my own internal debate. Um, because what I end up doing when this is all said and done as part of my job is to interpret what it is that we've done. Um, and I don't, I feel like that I'm, I'm overstepping when I jump into certain aspects and some I will and some I won't just because it makes sense in my head. My concern about this has to do with, I can't wrap my head around all the unintended consequences that this may result in in making the change that we've made it happen. For the last several years, we've been doing it this way. We're in a, we understand how to do this way. Most of the people that appear in front of me understand the way that it is currently. I don't, in a theoretical uh, view, I don't disagree that it would make some sense to put something in it that says, this is the way you calculate it. But I've been doing that so far. I assume my colleagues have too. So I don't know that we need that but if, it, if the bar thinks it's beneficial, I don't wanna stand in the way of that. And that's why I've kind of kept quiet through this whole thing. So um, I, I don't know that, that I can offer a lot at this point without feeling uncomfortable without the suggestions that I make, um, but those are the thoughts that I've been having during this discussion. So I don't know, Judge Rob, if you've got a, a different view on it. I don't. Um, I the one thing that I will say is we are always going to be met with uh, the bar saying we want a bright line, we want something that is black with white on the other side. And quite frankly, some of this just doesn't lend itself to that. Uh, we have, by the natural order of things, there is an ordering because you just have to set forth the various steps seriatim. I mean, there's no other way to do it in the statute. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to do it that way. And I would resist a formulaic, this is A, B, C, and this is how you must do it, because I think that does lock us into uh, unintended consequences that could be problematic down the road. My... I don't have a problem with saying child support is the sum of these because I think it, it, it makes it very, very clear that child support or child care and medical expenses need to be considered, have to be considered, must be part of the calculation. That part, I think, got watered down somehow. It wasn't the intent of this committee, but I think it got watered down somewhere. The adjustments part of it, we all know we are tiptoeing and dancing around calling the darn things deviations solely for <laughs> federal purposes. Um, but I can't ever get myself to not consider them to be the equivalent of what we used to do with deviations. Calculate and determine if you're going to deviate or adjust. One, two. Um, I think there's benefit in the public or private attorneys knowing that that's that solid number and then you you adjust it from there. What we wanted to get away from was our Supreme Court positioning that deviations were the were not to be the norm and you were almost slapped on the hand for them. Um, we wanted to get away from that. So I'm my brain brings me back to okay then maybe it is part of the it's part of the sum. And maybe it gets us out of trouble with the federal government looking at it because out of all of the adjustments, the one that we absolutely have to keep and utilize and be front and center is ability to pay. Almost should have been A instead of H, um, according to our dictates mm -hmm. federal rules. Um, but it is an adjustment. It is a change of the base child support amount 
when you get to that point and you consider it, once you're at that point of saying ability to pay. Um, but maybe I'm overcomplicating it by, by saying it should be an A and a B. I do like the simplicity of the child support is the sum of these four things. And do I agree with Judge Hoskin that it's almost like why we know to do that, but obviously not. That the public comment has been very clear. It is that there are judges not necessarily getting it and there is there are attorneys not necessarily getting it that way. So I do think we do need it, unfortunately. I know it's redundant sometimes to put in that type of language, but um, what I don't want to be lost in the process, if we do rearrange the statutes and take that language out of one, let me make sure I'm using the right statute number, the, the child care, the, the, the lengthy, um, I've got my brain wrapped around it now, that if we do 130 again, that we don't reinstitute the original language of 130, that we institute the spelled out version of child care that we all agreed on. Whether it's at the end of 140 or it's back in 130, I'm, I'm indifferent. As long as the first statute says, the sum is these four things, no matter what statute number it is, we can move them around and change the statute numbers. I find that scary from a public policy reason because of documents on the internet, forms on the internet that have already been created off of the current NACs, um, that there's an expectation that the child care stuff is in a certain number. So as long as the new, although if we put the new statute at the beginning, it's gonna renumber all of them anyways. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're, well, I, and Kim, if, if I could just interject, uh, down in the South, we went through a total rewrite of our uh, 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 eighth district court rules and uh, twice the numbers have changed and we've survived them. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had to go through and make some adjustments and it was difficult. It was painful in many respects, but we've survived them. And I think that since this, since our last iteration, the February 2020 was the first attempt, I think it uh, isn't unreasonable for people to understand that, you know, we've learned some things along the way and we're going to renumber these things. And we've just got to get it into a state that uh, makes sense for everyone uh, because we couldn't anticipate all of the things the last go around. So I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't let that control maybe what we do as we tighten up the language and, and we feel like we've, we've uh, settled that part of it. Then we do another review and we go through now that everything's in its place with X's and Y's and Z's. And then we, propose numbers. LCB is going to have their opinion on the numbering anyway, but uh, we can propose those numbers as well. And, and then maybe we have the ability to say, well, 140, uh, you know, everything in the 140 group, uh, whether it's 140, 145, 146, 148, whatever numbers we choose, but 140 is about the calculation. And the 150s are about adjustments and the 160s are about uh, whatever. Uh, we have that ability. We can make those recommendations. Fair. More than fair. <laughs> my, my concern here isn't as big. Like I said, it's not like we have like an extensive Supreme Court um, decisions quoting very specific statutes yet within these NACs that were, you know, I, I worry about the public reading a case and not knowing what the hell statute they're talking about. We have access to Westlaw and Lexis that the public doesn't necessarily have access to. Um, that's my perspective, it, it, from an NRS perspective of changing those things, but yes. Madam Chair, maybe, maybe I don't understand, uh, but we've got gaps in between these regulations that we can squeeze, in many cases, nine different regulations in between and keep the original. Is that not a possibility with LCB? I assume it is. No, it so is. I, it, it absolutely yeah. is. I'm, I'm speaking more of like when we delete 130 entirely and then we move it down below as, as uh, either incorporated into 140 or it becomes 141 or whatever number we have. 
that's a physical change. That's we've moved it from before 140 to after 140. So the numbering has to change. It's those that I'm talking about. But I, I don't see very many of those occurring given that we do have the numbers in between and, and they do that for this reason. So we can, as we learn things and we wanna insert some additional language, we've got some room in the numbers to do that. Well, let me just lobby for those of us who are getting old and just barely learned the numbers for the new ones. <laughs> perhaps maybe you could be cognizant of us in the process. <laughs> See, my concern's legit, right? <laughs> so, so this is just for the record, Madam Chair. I, I think it may be worthwhile to discuss where we would want a dot .xxx to go. Uh, when I was drafting it, I sort of had in mind uh, directly after 100. So it would be, uh, you know, for members of the public and the bar and wherever. Um, there currently is no 105, so it actually sort of fit yeah. right there, I thought, um, where it's sort of front and center. And, and we could obviously move the other ones around if we want to. You know, one of the values of having something like the dot XXX was it's at the front and people could say, okay, I need to find these four statutes because that's what my calculation is going to be. And I know, right, I mean, right now, I, I do agree. I think it is confusing if I was just reading this for the first time, where the very first one is, well, you could stipulate to something that doesn't follow these guidelines that you have no idea about. Um, but, you know, if that was, if that was there, whether we want to renumber or not, which I think is, is completely different or move certain things to be in a different order, um, that was where I sort of had in mind of, of putting it. Um, I would say before 100, because 100 then says the order must be based on the Alpacor's earnings. And that way you're talking about what the order is first. But, um, and it could be 050 under that, but I mean, I'm good with it either place before or after 100 does not hurt my feelings one way or another. Yeah, it, it, if we were to consider this, I'm sorry, Keith Pickard for the record, as a definitional statement, then 050 would make a lot of sense. Um, uh, we might wanna change the language so that it looks more like a definitional statement, but uh, otherwise we can make it, uh, um, um, you know, well, actually, I, I, I don't see a problem with uh, sticking it after 100, but I, I see your point. It becomes the definitional, and then 100 is actually the first manipulation. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, 090, uh, we, we could put it anywhere in there. Any other thoughts or comments on that? I like it be, being before 100. I'll just say it point blank. Um, just because I think it says child sports calculation of these. And it says, and by the way, that order that you're calculating and, and before that needs to be based on this. And oh, by the way, you can stipulate out of it is the third thing, right? Because stipulations are 110. And then it goes into the calculating. I like that. Sure, and, and maybe I, we make uh, 100, 105. We move it down to 105, replace 100 with the XXX language. Um, that will mean, I, I don't think we necessarily have a lot uh, uh, referencing uh, 100 anyway, uh, specifically. Yeah. And I personally like keeping the child support child care language in 130, the language we already voted on, but moving it back into 130 is my preference. Any other comments? Are you saying um, to leave 130 ahead of 140, leave the child care language ahead of the calculation itself? 
No, I, I, I do like the calculation being before, before it, then childcare, medical and childcare. I don't care which order those two go in. Yeah, and then, uh, then the adjustment language. Actually, we have a few statutes in between there, but. Madam Chair, um, this is uh, Bridget Rob for the record. Uh, the order to me makes sense uh, that we have medical first, then child care, because there's a requirement that um, medical be addressed in any child, um, child support obligation. So we do that one first, and then child care may or may not exist. So it makes sense to me that that be below the, the medical care. Okay. All right. Here's where I think we're at right now. I think um, perhaps Mr. Sanford, you and I maybe work on the next rendition of this because I've got the master document and you and I can keep kind of, we can get those other edits in there. We can get it moved around the right way. Um, and I think we have enough input from the committee to maybe come back with another rendition for the next meeting. Does that sound valid? I have no objection to that. I think um, there's obviously some cleanup to be done in, in what I've done and then incorporating it into the master document. Uh, I think we would probably need to vote if we want to. Yeah, I won't change the permanent master document. <laughs> yeah, because that is literally only the votes we've had. That's what I'm trying to keep my clean. I know what we voted on document, um, but I don't mind. Uh, I mean, if we take the document you have right now and, uh, or I can take the one that I've, never mind. You and I will work on it. You and I will talk about it. The best way to present it to the committee next. How about that? <laughs> just, just so that I'm clear on what the changes I would intend to make in addition to things. Um, starting, I guess, from the top, uh, 425.110, I had deleted the, that does not comply with such guidelines uh, in the stipulation piece. I think when I was doing that, that may have been a thought of, well, what if they want to stipulate in line with the guidelines? But uh, I, I think maybe that's a different thought. Let, I think we agree with Senator Pickard that we should put that back in and then maybe address stipulations in line with the guidelines separately. Um, then uh, there's some typographical issues in the actual .xxx language to fix. Did anyone else have any other ideas or pieces that we wanted to change? Keith Picker, for the record, so that I'm clear, I do see, you know, and, and I was going to uh, circle back on this, the, the comment about the uh, temporary assistance for needy family language. That's going to be a new agenda item. Right, right, right. right. No, I'm just trying to get my arms around what's uh, being manipulated here. That is a separate issue um, uh, for the future, but the rest of it above that in your, uh, Joseph, in, in your a document are new changes. Um, so maybe we should look at that. Um, um, were you uh, deleting guidelines is set, I'm looking at the second line. Uh, I like total, but the, the second line, the guidelines set forth. Um, um, In this chapter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why we need to drop that in lieu of uh, um, the number uh, because the number is going to be kind of the roadmap, but I don't know that we necessarily want to limit this language to that roadmap section. I, I would think that we would want to be broader in this opening statement that it's, you got to do it pursuant to the, uh, uh, the guidelines. Or you can stipulate to an obligation that does not comply with the guidelines provided they meet the following standards. Um, I, I, I think we might want to leave all of that language uh, above D. I, I think we might want to leave all of that in place. 
I see everybody squinting he, and well, I'm thinking yeah, NRS is represent NRS is reference the guidelines. Right. Guidelines are considered to be this entire body of NACs. That's where the confusion are supposedly the confusion. I have never had a confusion with this, but about the use of the word guidelines. But yeah. um, I think, yeah, I almost think the stipulation stipulation language can go at the very end of the NACs. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do anything that's above here, you can stipulate outside of it. <laughs> I, I like that Maybe idea. A lot. <laughs> yeah, I, but I'm, I'm just thinking that, uh, and, and again, I'm just trying to uh, consider potential arguments that might be made, you know, as uh, Joe was saying, he's seen about the medical support things, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the order uh, question. I'm wondering if, if we were to limit the, uh, or presumably refer to the NAC 425XXX, Instead of saying, you know, child support obligation determined pursuant to the guidelines, then are we opening a door to an argument saying, well, look, you know, 140 isn't uh, uh, included in XXX, even though by reference it is, um, you know, are we uh, introducing another avenue for an argument? And would it make more sense? And, and kind of where I'm going with this is in my mind, it makes more sense to simply say that. The obligation is going to be determined in the guidelines, but if you want to stipulate to something outside of the guidelines, then these are the th things you have to do. That's what I'm getting at. And uh, that's why I'm thinking that restoring the language makes more sense to me. Kathleen but that's Baker. just in my warped mind. Kathleen Baker, for the record. I think the confusion is, is that NAC 425.110 is part of the guidelines. And so if you're, I mean, how do you, how do you do something outside the guidelines when that's part of the guidelines? <laughs> well, and the new XXX is referencing child support that's calculated. Oh no, ignore me. I'm wrong. I just looked at the language again. Ignore my statement I was about to make. Um, yeah, that's the problem with the use of the word guidelines. That's back to where I said the NRS has referenced this entire body as the guidelines. Um, and we're trying to say, hey, if you do the regular calculation, you don't want to use it. You can stipulate, but you got to do X, Y, and Z. I don't have a problem with the way it's worded without putting that language back in there personally. Okay, and it, it, it's probably just me then. I, I don't want to take up any more time on it. Okay. All right, I think we have enough guidance, maybe. Um, and Mr. Sanford, I will do a call with you and we'll work our way through the what needs to be done or make sure we're on the same page, but well, enough to give another rendition to the committee for the next meeting. Okay, then let's move on to agenda item number six. Discussion and recommendations on formulas to address serial parenting. Exhibit three from committee member, Senator Pickard, and everybody should have received exhibit three. Senator. All right, thank you. Um, uh, this was, uh, we, we were trying to uh, approach this and, and uh, Karen and Joseph and I uh, were looking at how do we create language, but it occurred to us that you know before we go to drafting language, we make we wanted to make sure because this is a pretty substantive chunk uh, that we had everybody's buy-in as to the uh, concept of what we had in mind. And so what we developed was an outline uh, where uh, this is kind of our suggestion uh, as to where we think we want to go. At least the three of us were unanimous in our feelings about this. And, and then if the committee agrees with this, then we can start looking at language. But we proposed, uh, uh, well, first we noticed that Wisconsin, uh, on which whom we were based, um, uh, they went a different direction than what we were thinking, where they treat uh, each of the children uh, uh, as single children. And so you end up with stacking 18% uh, for each child. And it ends up uh, consuming, very quickly consuming 
the majority of the person's income if there are more than a couple of kids. And so we thought that that was inherently inequitable and begs for adjustments, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So instead, what we propose is that the serial parenting calculation only arises when there are two or more child support orders in effect at that time. And the reason we did that was because we got into the discussion about uh, do we want uh, parents to get credits for kids that are currently in their care? And generally speaking, in my experience anyway, that's not been the case. Uh, it's rare that uh, uh, I have had anyway, uh, a, uh, a judge say, well, look, you've got three more kids in your current household and your spouse is working and, and uh, uh, we're gonna give an adjustment to child support for the prior kids because you currently have kids, even if uh, uh, they were uh, stepchildren or whatever. And so uh, we thought that it would make more sense to limit this to consideration when you have multiple child support orders, but deliberately not include uh, uh, as part of the calculation, the, uh, any adjustment for uh, children in their care. Now that could be an additional uh, adjustment factor, but we didn't address that. The second piece would be that the obligations are based upon all of the children that are subject to a child support order, however many there are. And so uh, basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, if you've got four kids, you're gonna be calculated under the four child uh, calculation. If your uh, ex has three kids, uh, they're going to be child or uh, calculated under the three child calculation. And then we can balance across all of the orders. And uh, if, for example, it's an order that comes out of the uh, DAFS uh, program then or the Title uh, 4D program, then uh, they may elect to adjust all of them simultaneously, or we could do it later. And that's uh, uh, subject C. It's a second or subsequent order alone is not necessarily grounds to review a prior order. Uh, uh, although the DAFS may choose to do so, but it's not, uh, it, it's not intended to displace or create another factor uh, triggering a review. Uh, but once you hit that three-year review, then the adjustment uh, would be made. Or of course, if there's a 20% change, it would be made at that time anyway. And then of course, uh, um, uh, I've already stated D that was, uh, uh, just the rationale for why we did um, uh, A, which is uh, kind of wrapping it up. And then we had a couple of examples, which I won't try to walk through, um, uh, but it gives an idea of uh, how this would work. And then uh, the uh, summary at the end is just, um, uh, you know, the first child is given a consistent amount for a period of time. So uh, in other words, we're not uh, automatically reviewing, so they get to keep it. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the expiration of that three-year period would cause the review, the new application uh, would apply, and then the uh, child support would be um, uh, adjusted or, or um, modified rather. Uh, the uh, subsequent parents that assume the risk together that uh, the child support order is going to re remain in place, then have some clarity. It may be a bite or, or a struggle for them, but at least they know going in, this isn't uh, something that they're going to automatically get to uh, adjust. And then of course, the children of the current cohabitative relationship are treated as they are now. Um, but you know, the court always has the discretion under the ability to pay or, or other uh, equitable uh, factors to make adjustments as are necessary. So this was kind of the, the uh, uh, outline. This is how we think uh, that, that we want to approach it. And so we want to get the input of the committee. Uh, and if the committee is okay with this, then we can start working on language. Okay, Ms. Cliff or Mr. Sanford, do you have additional comments you want to add to that? No, I it just, I think Keith summarized it really well. The, the goal was really just, you know, this is really prevalent in the 4D program. Um, and the goal was really just to kind of ensure that the respondents' child support cases all mirrored each other 
and also to ensure that distribution to those cases would be equitable because as it is as it is now some cases are set substantially higher than others and so those cases get the lion's share of the portion just through the way the federal regulations are in the payment hierarchies and so it, it, the goal really was to sort of equalize not just the responsibility but also the payments that the cases would receive um, and just as senator pickard noted um, you know i think the hope is still that the adjustment factor would remain for additional children which would allow us to encompass those those families that are intact and find a way to to still give respondents those adjustments but uh thank you senator pickard for presenting on that one Mr. Sanford. I, I agree. Um, well, obviously part, part of the, the hurdle will be to make sure that it's clear that you know, intact families still have an adjustment even and that this is not intended to replace that portion. But um, the specific way to calculate, I think is best done when there's multiple child support orders, which is very prevalent in our cases and it is uh, it's a pretty extreme frustration when we'll have a case we'll be we'll doing it we'll be doing a hearing for um, and you know kids in, in similar circumstances with the same father will have vastly different child support orders um, even when they're you know even when they're reviewed relatively similar times um, and you know similar, similar incomes you know it's not not like we're changing a base income calculation we sometimes we use the exact same number but one judge will give you know a, a fairly significant deviation and one judge won't get any and then all of a sudden we're enforcing an order where you know one kid gets a, a completely different amount and i know that there was some thought back in, in the time that that was uh, perhaps appropriate you know because a choice was made and, and that sort of thing but that isn't usually very true in in practicality so i think keith summarized it very well um yes judge rob i don't do the child support um collection so uh forgive uh this uh, forgive my ignorance if i'm wrong here but um what do you do with a child support order that isn't either uh, issued in the state of Nevada or being enforced in the state of Nevada? I mean, presently, what do we do? What do we do? You mean when it's an out-of-state order? And we talked about that in our subcommittee. Um, obviously, in those cases, um, it would just be um, to encourage a modification, reach out to the initiating jurisdiction that has asked us to enforce the case um, and uh, you know encourage a modification but in terms of uh, whether we would consider that child absolutely right because there's a court ordered obligation and so but are you always I, I'm sorry for interrupting my point is are you always um, asked to enforce if there's an out-of-state child support obligation well if we weren't asked to enforce it we wouldn't have the case. So in my ex experience, we're, we're always enforcing, but, but there are cases that's, that don't seek our services. That's my point. If we're saying, I, I think we need to understand that there are cases that are gonna fall outside of your enforcement parameters that may be different. We just need to be cognizant of that. And if we're saying, if there is a child support obligation or a child support order, are we are we limiting it to what's in Nevada and or is enforced by Nevada or is it across the board and how do we capture that last bit? So I think we can only establish an order um, if we have uh, jurisdiction to do so. But what we can do where where the, the cases that we would impact are obviously cases that have sought our services. Otherwise, they're seeking private practitioners. Right. It would it would impact the private family law bar to, to be able to um, create these orders. But essentially, if we have a respondent that um, we have jurisdiction to establish an order for, and we have four cases, um, we're able to apply the serial parenting formula. They might have a case in Oklahoma that we're unable to address 
unless we have jurisdiction to modify it to a serial parenting formula. But yeah, there's always going to be cases that we can't touch, but, th but, but that happens now, right? We enforce cases that we don't have jurisdiction to, to modify or change. All we can do is encourage the initiating jurisdiction that has DEJ to modify it. I understand that. I'm just trying to look at this as the court who's going to be entering this, these orders. I'm not enforcing them, but I'm going to have to enter them. And I need to know how to do that. And right now I've got a, there's a hole in what I'm seeing. Um, I think this is a great start and please don't take my comments as criticisms because they're oh, not. No, no. I'm trying to understand. It's, it's kind of like um, order follows the child, right? So that's a that's a that's an NRS order follows the child. When we have an out of state order, we can't we, we we can't necessarily follow that, right? Because that's that that's a that's a local, uh, it's a state NRS. So this is this is similar. So the serial parenting we can't we can't apply it if we don't have jurisdiction to modify the order. But but uh, well, we're gonna have a difference. If we've got a child and a child support obligation that's out of state, and we've got a child who's here that I have jurisdiction over, and I'm establishing. Uh, child support right. with regard to the child here. Um, right. That's it that's applies. where I'm seeing some kind of conflict. Oh, no, no, no. And I'm just trying we... to see how we get around that. Right. No, the way it's written, it's any court order. As long as respondent has a court order, it doesn't necessarily need to be a Nevada order. They will benefit from a serial parenting formula. And that was my question. I, I apparently did not pose it well enough, but that no, gets to the root of my question. Right. So um, my comments, as uh, Kim Surratt, um, I'm impressed, <laughs> first off. As many times as we push this off to the side, you guys came up with something very, I, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, the only thing I would say in trying to convert this to language is on C under what you're proposing. Don't forget the long and lengthy discussions we've had about what language we actually have authority in this committee over in modification language. A lot of it's outside our scope, unfortunately, of authority within this committee. Um, one day, maybe we'll get that shifted over to us just because being able to mess with the modification language would help a significant number of issues we keep seeing arise with the committee and what's needed for the public and we're not able to play with that language but additional uh, i see miss chapel you have your hand up okay thank you yes uh, on on behalf of the state we we do see some potential concerns with this or possible consequences so we'll just want to make sure we have our deputy attorney general review the language once it's drafted and um, so we'll, we'll look forward to seeing that for the next meeting, I'm assuming, unless somebody wants um, one of our staff members to be involved on the subcommittee that writes the language that, that may be helpful. Okay, thank you. Judge Hoskin. Yeah, and let me start with a uh, nice job. Um, I've thought about this on several occasions and, and haven't been able to wrap my head around one, and this one seems to go in the right direction. The concerns that I have uh, at this point uh, have to do with what we've done in this committee to this point in time. We came up with the percentages we came up with because we looked at what it costs to raise a child. And my fear is that in, in diluting that by spreading it out over certain families, are we losing sight of the numbers that we came up with and the calculations that we came up with initially for how much it costs to raise a child based upon the incomes that we were looking at because we're diluting it out over several households and doing it this way. I don't know that it's wrong. I just wanna raise the issue that perhaps that's a concern we need to take a look at and make sure we're not sidestepping all that we did years ago and getting us to that point. Um, and I think I had two comments. Well, the other one has to do with the, the example. Uh, it just struck me as funny, but I'll leave that. To, I'll have a conversation outside for that one. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to address that, Judge. Um, uh, we we kind of touched on it in the beginning of our discussions, although I think we were probably all in the same place and, and went past it pretty quickly. But in my mind, as I was wrestling with that notion, that very issue, uh, because that was really uh, the, the lead off to the legislation and, and the beginning of the first iteration of the committee, uh, you know, how do we 
determine what the uh, uh, the needs of the child are and and how do we make sure that we're meeting those needs and and I think that uh, in at least in my mind as we were considering in the first go around how the uh, percentages and and the needs were being met across multiple kids and and so then we justified the uh, uh, the changes based on uh, the uh, uh, number of kids that it took or the amount of money it uh, uh, cost to raise a child um, uh, or two children or three children in a particular household. And so those numbers uh, declined as an individual proposition. Those assumptions still uh, uh, are true, um, not necessarily to the same degree. In other words, I think if we were going to try to preserve that as the first and only consideration, then the Wisconsin model makes more sense, where it's, no, if we're talking about three different single moms with one child, uh, it's 18%. And if you fathered, you know, three, uh, to, to continue my example, if you fathered three kids amongst three other uh, single women, and uh, you, uh, uh, you know, you, you have to pay your portion, then that's 18% right down the line. But then we have to overlay the needs of the individual to be able to maintain their, their ability to live. And so those are naturally going to, and, and that was part of the original conversation too, uh, because we didn't really consider, or at least there was an argument that we hadn't really considered a person's ability to maintain their, their own life while paying child support. And so I think that because that intersection occurs very early in that calculation, I'm okay with the thought that, uh, you know, we, we are, particularly in the example I just gave, where you've got three different single women with one, only one child, we're, we're also overlaying that the father's ability to maintain his own uh, life while paying support. And that's where I see that interaction and the balancing occurring. I don't know that we're ever going to get to uh, the correct answer per se, but I think that there's it, it's a balancing question, and I'm okay with it. I would. I don't disagree. Go ahead. Ken. Yeah, I would add a layer to that, which is almost quoting Miss Cliff, which is it's not like the low income schedule actually is enough money to care for a child. It's not. It doesn't cover the cost to care for a child. But that's looking at reality, which is a lot of families don't make enough money to care for the child or themselves or anything really, um, or meet any of their needs, but that's the reality of their family and their circumstances and their situation. They're not meeting the needs of the child, but we're going to take what percentage we can. And when you have 10 kids and you make minimum wage, do you flat out, you're never making enough to, you know, meet the needs of the child. You're probably not making enough to meet your own needs, but you're going to have to give up some of it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and for me, it's more intellectual honesty in, in what it yeah. is that we've done. The, the months we spent trying to get a come up with a percentage and starting with 16 and the fact that we go from 16 to 22 and sent from 16 to 30, whatever, 32, no, 16, 20, 32, right. Sorry, math's never been my strong suit, um, is because there's a shared cost in that household. Right. And now we're dealing with more than one household and we're reducing it and firstborn child the cost for raising firstborn child in that household doesn't drop because there's a second born child in another household. But what we're doing is we're putting a specific amount that that's going to drop and taking away that discretion from the court and being able to analyze the separate households and be able to deal with that. So uh, again, I'm not, don't take this as a hammering of the formula. I don't know that there's ever going to be one that I'm going to be able to say, yes, that is perfect, or any of us are going to be able to. I just want to express that concern that we as a committee need to be intellectually honest and it's okay if you're still in the same household this percentage will for the most part support a child but if you've got another child then you know what we're throwing that out the window and we're going a different direction that's my only concern with the way that we're proposing this but judge don't you think or, or as i read the adjustment factors i think you can make adjustments to right size that order um, if the, the court takes testimony as to the other uh, 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 families, the, the costs that are incurred, the other uh, uh, burdens that are on them, the court, I think the court still has the ability 
to adjust the final number to account for those things. So I don't think it's totally lost from the picture, uh, but it, it, in terms of a calculation, I think, at least in my mind, where we're looking at the person's right to be able to uh, uh, you know, pay for their own lives and then uh, balance that, in other words, the need, the ability to pay piece it, it, in addition to their own needs and uh, the needs of the child, I think that's a balancing. And, and uh, I've always thought that the uh, calculation was the, the, the first, it, it, it doesn't get us to the actual endpoint because we've got adjustment factors. Do you, do you disagree that the adjustment factors are enough or, or maybe we need to revisit the adjustment factors? Well, my concern has more to do with the establishing of this is the amount that we start with and then we adjust from there when in my mind, it makes more sense to go the other direction. Uh, and that's the way that I've been handling it to this point in time. Certainly the, the appellate courts have told me uh, what they think about what I've done. But uh, my analysis is it's not, you talk balancing between uh, best interest of the child and ability of obligor to, to make his bills. Those aren't equal in my mind. The child has to, it's a child support obligation, not a let's let obligor continue to survive in the manner that he survived or she survived in the past. That's not my mandate the way that I understand it. So and I agree. is not what I'm doing. I agree. That's as to the weight though of the uh, considerations, not so much that they're there, uh, but I agree with you. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we need to put the children first uh, in every instance. But at some point, you know, we are also talking about the practical reality of enforcement. If, you know, and, and this is something that we talked at length about, uh, if you end up with uh, under, for example, the Wisconsin model where you've got 36% of your income going out the door, your chance of, of making that or of meeting that obligation is so slim that most people uh, who can't do it will just walk away from it. And now we, the, the kids get nothing. And so when I say balance, I'm not talking about, you know, balancing the scales as if they were equal, but we're considering it in the balance and trying to figure out, you know, from all these different angles, how do we make it something that the children are going to receive? How is it uh, something that we can, you know, look at this from the equities of the case? And in I my just view, call it right size and you're done. If that's all we're trying to do, call the yeah. right size to order, let the judges make that determination and we're done. But I, I and I, I understand the importance of, of trying to get this serial thing done. Yeah. We've been dealing with it now for years. Um, but um, I don't think it's as simple as as we're making it out to be. And I don't know. Um, it, it's a, I don't know that I would if, if this is what the, let me put it this way. If this is what the committee decides to do, I will implement it. And I will apply it. Um, and the appellate courts can tell us. Uh, or the legislature can tell us what we're doing wrong if we're doing it wrong. I just, I have a concern from the intellectual honesty standpoint of how we started this. And if we can do something that would uh, satisfy that in my mind, then I'm, I'm happy to vote in favor of doing something along these lines. I, I'm not there yet. Well, as saying. I said at the outset, this outline was to flesh out these comments and conversations. So this is yeah. great. Uh, if, oh, yeah. If you have an idea of how you would like to see that that better meets uh, your thinking, um, uh, we're, we're open to it. We're, we're not stuck on this. From a judicial standpoint, my preference is we don't touch it at all and let me deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, but that's just my standpoint. Um, certainly, I understand from a practitioner standpoint, it's nice to be able to have something you can rely on. Um, so yeah. I don't know that I'm going to be able to help you with that process. Yeah, no. OK, well, I just think that uh, from the practitioner standpoint, uh, we have to uh, we, we have to strive toward predictability. And if we don't touch it, then there is no predictability, because I although I tend to agree with how you address this in the first go around, uh, which is why I supported uh, taking your concept and, and moving it into the law to the extent that we did. Um, I know there are lots of judges that have a very different view. And so from one courtroom to the adjoining courtroom, we can have vastly different answers. And so to the extent that this provides predictability, particularly for the, uh, uh, the, the litigants 
who are represented and have somebody telling them, hey, this is what's likely to happen. Uh, I, I, I think that this is necessary. All right, this is Karen. Would it would it satisfy maybe Judge Hoskin? Would it would it kind of satisfy maybe some of the members if we added that serial parenting calculation was discretionary? I like it. I could see that being beneficial just because I could see the run of the mill cases that you're dealing with, Miss Cliff and Mr. Sanford and Miss Baker. Um, you need a system, and you're just going to apply it on broad strokes to many cases, I'm sure, and then. For the rest of us that have the one-offs, it gives us the ability to argue it's a one-off and there's a reason behind it. But okay. Judge Rob. One of the, the bedrocks for me coming into this uh, committee was that similarly situated children, no matter where they were in the state, no matter which judicial officer they were in front of, were going to be treated similarly. And I'm afraid if we, if we pull that and say, yeah, we'll apply it to basically the low income people who are the ones that Mr. Sanford and Ms. Clift and Ms. Baker are really doing the collection activities for, for the most part, but we're gonna have a different law for more money um, people yeah. who are in front of the, the district court. I've got a real problem with that dichotomy. And that to me, to use Judge Hoskins language, that to me is not intellectually um, equal, nor, nor does that satisfy what was my bedrock um, proposition coming to this. We need to have all kids basically treated in a similar way in the state of Nevada. Yeah, and I think by making it discretionary, we make it illusory. Uh, and I have to agree with you, Senator Pickard, on your other comment, though. Yes, Judge Robb and Judge Hoskin, knowing the Child Support and Acts extremely well at this point, will apply a method that is fair and works while others will not necessarily do so. Um, We've we got half it. a dozen new judges down here who barely <laughs> know the law anyway. <laughs> yeah, a, a system is extremely helpful. Chairwoman, I, perhaps to help slightly towards the intellectual honesty aspect, which I agree from Judge Hoskin is, I mean, that is, that is part of it, right? And mm -hmm. to me, there was two, two fundamental principles on which the base support obligation calculation was, was formed. And the first was, what does it cost to raise a child? And that clearly isn't going to change, you know, if you have serial homes, I mean, the cost to raise a child in each individual home is, is higher. And then the second part of it was, what would a, you know, a family, what would they actually spend if they had this many children to raise them? What would they actually put towards those children um, if they were an intact family? And that was part of why, you know, say, when you say have two children, especially when we're using gross percentage numbers, you know, gross numbers are very difficult where the yeah, average percentage, especially as it gets higher, becomes more and more relevant. Um, and so that was part of, I think, our discussion was, you know, perhaps the, the finite amount of how much it takes to raise a child wouldn't change in the serial parenting situation, but the, how much would you discretionarily provide towards those children, especially um, in the folks who are not on the low income table, which I mean, I think we are already addressing that in terms of the low income table just doesn't meet those needs. And we know that. Yeah. And that is something that maybe we should put on the agenda as far as adjusting the language in 100 to, I think, reflect that because I, I do agree that it, it doesn't. And so maybe we should be cognizant of that. Um, but, you know, so the, for those folks where our formula was designed to say, this is what an impact family would have spent. And that's why we came to the number that we came to. Um, that maybe that does make more sense to me in a serial parenting context to say, I, even though they're in separate homes, I have this many children, this is how much I would have given to them so that I can also still do the remainder of my life. And so 
that's part of how it came to intellectual honesty. I do agree it's not as entirely honest as, you know, what we would do is if you would, you know, maybe maybe create a completely separate formula for it. I, I don't know that I want to go there, <laughs> but um, that was how I was thinking when I was was reviewing this with with folks was that aspect is is more honest to me and the folks where it really breaks down is already on the low income table and they don't they don't meet it anyway yeah i think we might get into some trouble though if we start uh, uh tinkering with the uh, language about the presumption that the basic needs are met because i think that's a requirement of the the federal side of this um, that our uh, guidelines do. So I think if we start tinkering with that language, we may create another problem. I think maybe we would just meet both guidelines and do something like meets the basic needs of the child as limited by the obligor's ability to pay, something along those lines, so that we you know, use both magic words at the same time. I will add it to the agenda. <laughs> Ms. Cliff, I saw you. No, I, um, I think in proposing the formula, it wasn't necessarily advocating for a serial parenting, um, you know, section of the NAC. Um, it was just sort of tasked and it's, it's, it's an interesting thought. And I agree, it, it doesn't necessarily meet the needs of the child, especially when you look at the low income guidelines, you look at four children, you look at the lowest tier, you're, you're looking at somewhere along $30 per child. It's not going to meet the needs, but, but outside of the low income schedule, um, once you get into a percentage, you know, let's say we have somebody working at Republic Services and they're making, you know, X, X number of dollars per hour, support for one child, you know, might be, who knows, $800 a month. But let's say they do have, you know, two other cases or three other cases. And now these petitioners are getting substantially less. And this petitioner in this particular case who maybe adjusted her life or his life to private school and athletics suddenly three years pass or whatever that looks like. And now we're, now we're in on a change of circumstance and uh, this petitioner is going to get substantially less based upon the serial parenting formula. Um, I can see where this is gonna get very, very messy. I, I can see what Judge Hoskin is, is saying. Um, and honestly, it's, it's not an easy issue. Um, and I think as a committee, we just need to decide whether we want to address serial parenting, whether there's value in having a set formula. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's not always the low income schedule. And, and, I, and, I, and I hear what Judge Rob is saying about treating all families the same. And, and we do enforce a lot of cases here and they're not all low income. Um, we have 45,000 cases here just in Clark. And, and so I don't wanna say that only low income populations seek our services. A fair number of these cases are coming from district court. About half of our population is on state assistance in Clark. The other half is not. And so we do see both sides of the coin. Um, I'm not advocating for one side more than the other, but I can see it impacting families across the board, low income or not, so. Well, and when you're talking about low income, you're talking about, I mean, you can't create income that's not there, right? <laughs> right, you can't say, oh yeah, but that's not meeting, you know, a lot of society doesn't meet the child's needs. And, but, the counter to that is, in theory, public services that are helping meet that child's needs in other ways. That's when Medicaid kicks in. That's when, you know, we've got other benefits, right? In theory, if they're utilizing them for the child's benefit. But as a committee right now, I think what unless there's an objection from the committee, what we do right now is let the subcommittee maybe wrap their brains around it again based on these comments. I keep it on the agenda. I'd like to mill over it. I know I personally, um, does that sound like a game plan for right now? Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's probably a good idea because uh, my thoughts have changed a little bit, although I think I'm still leaning in one direction. Why don't I suggest this? Let's uh, circle back next uh, meeting to make a determination as to uh, whether or not we want to adopt this to, to Judge Hoskins' point, make the decision as to the direction we're going to go. And then if we direct 
or if we decide to move forward with a serial parenting formula, uh, then uh, the subcommittee can start working on language. It, but if the uh, consensus is uh, that we decide not to do anything, uh, we can make that decision next week and our next meeting and, and we'll know what to do. Okay. All right. Hearing that, I think what we will do is move on to agenda item number seven. Um, being cognizant of its two, uh, 1045, I do want to address this item and then we'll talk about the game plan from there. Uh, agenda item number seven is discussion and recommendations on the proposed language for NAC 425.115 subsection three for joint physical custody to change the language to one half of the difference versus the full difference in child support values. Um, when this was last discussed, because we've had several meetings where we didn't make it to this agenda item, the discussion was to give DWSS additional time to consider this and come back with some input on it. Um, Ms. Uh, Schappel, are you prepared to do that today? I am not, I apologize, no. Um, we need to probably come back to this one for the next. And we'll be doing the research on that uh, on agenda item number six we just covered. So we can do this at the same time. Okay. So I believe that's where we're gonna get to on the next couple of agenda items. Agenda item number eight is discussion and recommendations on the proposed language for NAC 425.115 subsection four for scenarios in which a parent has primary physical custody of one child each. Ms. Baker, you proposed this issue to us at one point, but I do not believe anybody's had the opportunity to work on that language or propose language for it. Ms. Baker, can I ask you that for the next committee meeting, maybe you'd be prepared to propose some petition, potential language for that? Or we can- Ms. Kathleen Baker, for the record, I will take a look at it. And uh, actually, not only are we talking about the primary physical custody of one child with each parent, but I thought this, section was also supposed to address the Miller situation where the parents perhaps had primary custody of one child and shared physical custody of the second child. So I'm wondering whether we should have this agenda item include yeah, that. My only, that. my only concern there, Ms. Baker, is that the Miller decision was considered. Our NACs do consider it. It chose a different method than the Miller decision chose. And we incorporated that decision and this committee came to a very clear line decision on that. I don't really wanna revisit it um, as a committee unless there's been a shift in beliefs on the committee from that original decision. And my, that's not the issue. The issue is that it's not clear in NAC 425.1154 that the Miller decision was taken into account and that we were going to use the same formula for joint physical custody for situations that were addressed by Miller. So I think that we have missing language in this section, not just for if each parent has custody of one child, but if each parent, if one parent has primary and another, and then they have joint of another. I don't think that's addressed. And I think the intent was to have that addressed in this section. Okay. Um... All right, well, I'll add the, I will expand the agenda item description to include that and allow you to come back next meeting with some proposed uh, changes. Thank you. You're welcome. Agenda now, item. Can I make a specific request on that? Uh, okay. Ms. Baker, I'm not following uh, exactly, and it's undoubtedly just because I haven't experienced this. So if in your presentation, you can kind of flesh out a little bit what you think is missing and, and uh, explain that, uh, I would appreciate it. I will work on that. And agenda item number nine, discussion and recommendations, clarification. I'm just gonna skip the rest of that language regarding alimony. We kept this on the agenda, we did discuss it, um, but we've kept it here because I know we wanted to wrap our brains around it a little bit more. I'm gonna propose if maybe, um, Judge Rob, if you and I maybe take a good look at this and decide if there are any other proposed changes we wanna to recommend to the committee um, for the next meeting, you and I are the only ones really not tasked with a job at the moment. Um, well, Judge Hoskins kind of off the hook right now too, I think, but he's done a lot of other prior, you made a lot of prior other recommendations. So I'm let, leaving you right where you're at. Um, if you don't I'm, mind. I'm, I'm happy to jump in if you guys want, want me to, to play in that one as well. Okay. 
Was that a yes, Judge Rob, too? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> threw you under the bus. Okay. And Kim, uh, you've got a lot on your plate. So if you want me to also be part of that, I'm happy to. And in fact, on any of these. Okay. I'm trying to watch that master document like a hawk right now to make sure we're good and the agendas. But thank you. I appreciate that. So that's how we're going to deal with agenda item number nine today and not discuss it further in committee right now. Um, for agenda item number 10, it's discuss and approve ideas for future agenda items and the next meeting date and time. Um, right now, based on conversations during the committee, uh, we have, I have that I'm going to add discussion regarding 425.1101D, which is the TANF language where uh, Senator Pickard is recommending we add or or its successor rendition, or we'll have to figure out that language, but I'll add that to the agenda. Um, the discussion about the word equitable in terms of uh, splitting of medical costs as an agenda item. I have, and these are new agenda items versus, we're gonna come back to the ones already on the agenda. And uh, discussion of agenda item number 100, regarding the low income table, not meeting the needs of the children or not. I, that's a vague entry based on the other discussions. I may just come back up with serial parenting, but uh, just in case there's language changes needed there, I'm going to keep the uh, agenda item number from today, number five on the agenda. And I'm going to keep the serial parenting number six on the agenda. And then we talked about uh, seven, eight, nine, they'll remain on the agenda, but with uh, assigned people. And Ms. Chappell, do you have an additional item? Yes, thank you. Um, I've been notified by um, the program that uh, in reviewing, Margot Chappell for the record, sorry, uh, our, our rules around this committee that um, I believe you were elected chair in 2017 and there's a four year every four years, there needs to be a new election. So that can go on next agenda, please. Um, and, and committee members were, were welcome to reelect uh, Chair Surratt, uh, but we just need to do it as a formality. Thank you. Love it. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I, I think, didn't, didn't we deal with that at the outset of this? I thought that uh, we went through and we it's realized- It's not in any of the minutes. Oh, it should be in the minutes on the very first meeting we had. We uh, went through, Kim was elected uh, chair, I was elected vice. Because we, we did elect, yeah, Senator Pickard as our vice chair to replace Don Baker. Who, yeah. Don Baker. Okay, uh, excuse me, Margo Chappell, for the record, I'll go back and look at the minutes and maybe I'm incorrect. So, um, well, but I'll, I'll get back to you, uh, Chair Surratt, if we still need that on the agenda. Thank you. You may be correct. It may not have gotten in the minutes and we may have missed it. So uh, we may need to uh, adjust the minutes. Or just elect me out. No, yeah, or, or just <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> Madam Chair, that is not an option. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a system down, but it's, it's chaotic. <laughs> Yeah, and Margo Chapel, for the record, I mean, our, our DAGs can weigh in, but I don't think we can go back and change minutes after they've no. already been approved by the committee. Um, so we just may need to, uh, yeah. And so apparently that uh, Joy is confirming that the only election was for the co-chair. So we didn't elect, re-elect a chair. Um, and, and so we'll just, if we can put that on the agenda next time, that'd be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Any additional agenda items? All right, uh, the committees are the, the, for the agenda items that we have, there's some good amount of work that needs to be done. Um, this last time, just so you know, we had issues with getting the exhibits and the agenda ready and we didn't have enough time for public notice on it to have that last meeting. That's why we had to cancel it. So um, I'm doing a better job of getting off the meeting and <laughs> creating the next agenda right then and there. Um, but, uh, Two weeks is tight when it comes down to, because I have to have it approved, the AG has to, uh, our DAG has to review it, et cetera. I mean, there's steps. So uh, three weeks usually works pretty good for me. Is there any reason to spread it out further than that in the committee's eyes? 
I will not be available uh, the uh, Fridays of the 8th, 15th, or 22nd. Okay. So if we want to keep this on a Friday, and I'll be out of the country the week of the, the 11th entirely. So um, uh, if we want to keep it on a Friday, the next Friday I can attend, and I'm not suggesting you guys can't go on without me, uh, is the 29th. Um, I want some sufficient time for this interim, you know, subcommittee to get their work done. So I don't actually mind the 29th. Uh, keeping in mind as a committee, what the steps are after we make decisions to, uh, you know, our final decisions on edits we want made, we are getting closer and closer to another legislative session. Um, at that meeting, I would probably recommend that wherever we are with with the votes that we have and the edits we've already made, then maybe we go ahead and submit those. And then we keep going as a committee on work that we're doing um, and get it moved on to DWSS so they can get it to um, Ledge Commission for review. And so that we're not stuck in this war pole of the session and post session getting any of those passed. Does that sound uh, I, reasonable? I don't disagree, except that the LegCom can meet during the session. In fact, we did uh, in 19. And uh, uh, I, I would uh, resist uh, making, uh, because some of this is, is structural. We need to at least get that much done, no matter how much time it takes. Otherwise, I think we're, the, the, the piecemeal effect is going to have a negative uh, impact. We're, we're only going to have little pieces done and it won't really make sense across the, uh, the continuity of the, the regs. So yeah, there, there'll be a point where we're cut off on having meetings because we won't have the support as an sure. administrative body. Sure, um, sure. So that's the only other thing. So it doesn't have to be April 29th is not dead set on us having to submit things, but just in terms of how much work the subcommittees do between now and then, maybe just kind of start keeping that whole uh, <laughs> the legislative session in mind and what turns into chaos. So although they can meet, um, sometimes making getting LCB to do its work closer mm -hmm. to session is the problem. Yeah. No point working on the administrative stuff in lieu, it, to trade to trade in their time for bill requests. Completely so, agree with that. Yes. So that's the bigger issue. I mean, we it, it, and DWSS has to still take it from us to run their own public meetings before they submit it to LCB. And then we have to wait for LCB right. to turn the language around before it can be introduced. And so, um, no, I completely agree. I'm just bigger picture. trying to keep in my own mind that uh, whatever we put up, we need to make sure that we've looked at it front to back and, and it makes sense and, and we're comfortable with it as it then stands, so. Okay, so I'm gonna set the next meeting for April 29th, again, 9 a.m., our normal time frame. Um, and I love when we're on Zoom, so hopefully we still have that support for that date. But Joy uh, or Ms. Tomlinson will triple confirm for us and you all receive emails from her. Keep in mind, I will get the agenda done right away and hopefully we can get it approved faster. Exhibits, on the other hand, um, all of you keep in mind whatever exhibits you submit, everybody needs time to review them. And it's really difficult when we send you the agenda and the exhibits for the first time right before the meeting. And I know that's hard on everybody to contemplate. When we send the exhibits out, I can't do it. You guys can't do it individually to the whole committee. Um, Joy will bring it through Ms. Tomlinson when you do stuff like that. But Mr. Sanford, I see your hand up. Madam Chair, I was just gonna make a comment to uh, maybe refrain from using the word subcommittee uh, when talking about what we're doing. I, I don't think we have any official subcommittees I, because then I believe we have to notice them appropriately and. And it's a huge thing. Um, okay. So we have a couple of folks who are going to do some work, but I don't believe we have any subcommittees. Got it. Just okay. to, um, along the lines of what uh, what he was saying, uh, just 
be cautious about walking quorums and um you know because you, you were the committee was talking about doing some work between this meeting and the next meeting and just um just be careful with uh with the walking quorum issue yes and this committee's been um told that many a times if as a reminder though the work walking quorum is if you hit a quorum within this committee in sub conversations and that could be yep you're in trouble so when two of you uh, or three of you work on a topic, keep it amongst yourselves until we're in front of the full committee. Judge Hoskin. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's any uh, inclination to having us get back to normal with these meetings rather than everything on Zoom. Is that even in the plans? It has not been given to us as an option from, um, from the legislature, from the building. Um, Ms. Tomlinson will look into it again, I believe, and we will find out. I would love for us to. Um, it hadn't been an option yet, but I think it's very productive when we do it forces our hands. Okay. Anything else to add to the agenda? Okay. This time we'll move on to agenda item number 11, which is public comment. Uh, for anybody willing or able or desiring to give public comment, you are welcome to do so at this time. This is brought to my attention. Our agenda does say three minutes, not two minutes, so I will give you that three minutes. And Ms. Tomlinson, if you could please uh, take public comment. To give public comment, please raise your hand in the Zoom meeting or press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. I'm showing no hands are raised at this time. Okay, thank you, Ms. Tomlinson, I appreciate that. All right, thank you everybody for your hard work. We'll adjourn this meeting and uh, have our next meeting on April 29th, 9 a.m., either by Zoom or in person. And the public will still be given a phone number, even if it's in person, so if you're listening and you will desire to participate, there is still the ability, if we're in person, to do it by phone. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Well done. Thank you. Bye.